modern constitutional law in the last, say, 50 or 60 years has been completely obsessed with the question, what is the standard of review? What is the attitude? What are the set of institutional arrangements which should govern the way in which judges behave? Uh, the 19th century strategy was rather different. You looked at a text and you try to figure out what it meant, and then you applied it one way or the other. Modern people engage in this extensive preliminary self-psychosis and analysis, and what they come up with is the notion that they ought to be very careful before they interfere with the operation of the political branches of government. And there are two difficulties, I think, with this particular position. Um, one of them, there's absolutely no textual warrant in many cases for adopting a position of judicial restraint. Um, if you wish to be accurate with respect to original intention and with textual design, if there are broad protections that are inserted into a constitution, then there is an obligation to breed them broadly. And so if you have a clause which says, uh, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, it doesn't mean some kinds of public property, it doesn't mean possession, it means the full range of private property institutions as they've developed at common law and by the statutes which are designed to supplement and to expand its operation, like recordation statutes on the one hand and the statute of frauds on the other. If there's a provision which starts to deal with the protection of freedom of speech, you can't talk about just speech. You also have to talk about freedom. And it turns out there is no one-sentence version of what we mean to freedom. It's a rather elaborate theory which tries to constantly talk about the uh, need for individual autonomy on the one hand and the need to prevent one individual from trespassing on the like liberties of others as a second part to this particular theory. So in my view, if the moment you start to end into a situation of judicial restraint, uh, you are not faithful to constitutional text, you are not faithful to constitutional meaning. Uh, the causes of this, of course, are very great. Um, if one looks around and tries to figure out what is wrong with respect to governments over the world, you come to the very melancholy conclusion that by and large they are failed experiments. In some cases, like with Russia, they are failed experiments which continue to repeat each other at an alarming rate. And the question is, what is the source of that? And well, it turns out to be the dominance of the legislative and the executive branches. It turns out to be the fact that any rule of law that they promulgate um, will be binding on the individuals whom they wish to oppress, but any law which is designed to limit their behavior is hopelessly ambiguous and therefore should be given whatever favorable interpretation an ingenious court can be able to identify in the particular case. Uh, so what happens, in effect, with the judicial restraint situation is that in the effort to stop judicial abuse on the one hand, you open the way up to congressional and executive power abuse on the other. And the art of government is not one that shuts down all abuse. You can never do that with a set of institutions so complicated. But you're trying to figure out how you limit the sum of the abuses of three branches of government. And you do not do that by saying, in effect, uh, that the court should stand aside on major constitutional issues and that the legislature and the executive should, in fact, have full branch. Uh, to give some explanation as to why it is that this theory actually works when you start to apply it, uh, what I would like to do is to point to a couple of areas in which classical liberal principles have uh, had fairly powerful influence, and then ask yourself whether or not you think that they have had baleful social consequences. One of them is, with the exception of recent stuff on campaign financing, all of the material with respect to freedom of speech is in fact organized along classical liberal lines. We have broad definitions as to what count this speech, including other forms of aggression, rather of expression, not aggression. We have justifications that could limit speech based upon force and fraud. We have fairly sharp limitations on the kind of remedies that could be imposed. Uh, then when you look at something like the Dormant Commerce Clause, even people like Justice Stevens are extremely astute in the way in which they examine taxation and regulation to make sure that they do not deviate from the requirements that are needed in order to assure open competition across state law. And so the Justice Jackson, who gave us Wicked and Filburn, also gave us um, some other cases, um, Hood against Lamont, for example, in which he essentially defends free competition across state lines. And that jurisdiction and that jurisprudence turns out to be perfectly sustainable over the long haul. And it remedies, ironically, one of the defects in the original Constitution, and namely the fact that we did not have any strong limitations in the federal government that could prevent state aggrandizement, of, of state aggrandizement through protectionism um, and uh, various interference with interstate travel and communications and the like. 
So you have all of these things going on simultaneously. So I think, in effect, to some extent, uh, that the judicial restraint model uh, does not and should not be given the kind of paramount respect that it often happens. Now, when you go to the other side, we take into account the progressives. They have a view which, in many ways, overlaps that associated with conservative judges. Uh, the progressives also believe uh, that the courts ought not to interfere with respect to the general regulation of the economic system of the United States, although in many cases they will, sometimes right and sometimes wrong, protect various forms of individual liberties against government oversight and control. But the difference between them and the judicial restraint types is that most conservative judges support legislation they don't like, whereas most progressive judges support legislation that they do like. And the question is, well, why do they do this? And well, essentially, they believe that the definition of a market failure, in many cases, is a competitive market. They regard that these things, in fact, create inequality of bargaining power, that they result in massive inequalities of wealth. But what they forget in all of these cases is that the presumption with respect to any voluntary contract is that it produces gains between the parties. Uh, the more rapid you could get these transactions going forward, the larger the sum of the games will be, and that the need to worry about contracts is largely confined to antitrust type risks on the one hand and conspiracy risks to commit violence and fraud and other kinds of things. So the progressives essentially developed a series of strongly anti-competitive institutions through the 1930s, the Motor Vehicle Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Civil Aeronautics Act, the National Labor Relations Act, and so the list goes on. And each and every one of these, it turns out, has sapped the strength of the American country, American Republic, and has made it more difficult for us to grow the nation in a way that solves huge numbers of problems.